But I remember one body that was brought in and the pathologist, one of the pathologists was standing next to me and I said, who do you think that is? And she said, without any shadow of a doubt, that's one of the terrorists. There's no legs, the rib cage was basically no flesh on it and clearly the hold on with the bomb was either on his lap or by his feet. I joined the Flying Squad in uh, 2002. Flying Squad started just after the First World War and there was a, a large uh, spate of uh, armed robberies. A lot of the soldiers coming back from the war couldn't get uh, jobs. A lot of them were traumatised. Um, and uh, in order to live, they basically did robberies and they all knew how to fire a gun and there were a lot of guns in circulation. The Flying Squad was set up, and the reason it was called the Flying Squad, because of the first team of detectives to get vehicles that had uh, radios so they could communicate with each other, and they basically dealt with all armed robberies, and their forte is ambushing the criminals, as we call it, going across the pavement. There was three things that the Flying Squad pride themselves on, is speed, uh, aggression and surprise. What was, you would say, your biggest case at Flying Squad? Uh, there was lots of them, but the one that springs to mind, which was quite audacious, uh, it was a case that one of my colleagues, Jeff, Jeff Davis, who was a DI on the team at the time, a detective inspector, Jeff had been given some intelligence that a gang of criminals from East London that uh, ran a boxing gym uh, had managed to uh, get hold of a, a van, or a lorry if you like, that looked identical to a cash and transit van. And they painted it uh, so it looked like the real thing. They'd even managed, this is the intelligence we had, they even managed that they were uh, had uniforms and they'd uh, falsified documents. So if they went in uh, to the office, they could um, take out a large amount of foreign currency that had just come into the, the into Gatwick Airport. But our intelligence was very specific in as much that they were going to drive airside with all their false passes, their false uniforms, their uh, camouflaged cash and transit wagon, draw this money from the office, because allegedly they had all the paperwork, and, um, you know, make off with it. And it wouldn't be till some time afterwards when the real cash in transit people come to collect it, they discover that the money had gone. The senior officer at Scotland Yard took a very, very dim view of this because it was bordering on terrorism in a way, because, you know, uh, innocent travellers on the airways could have been put at risk. In any event, we went down, I think it was every Thursday from about four o'clock in the afternoon till midnight, one o'clock in the morning, the whole team from our office, which was probably 25 to 30, you know, officers, detectives, men and women, uh, in our um, plainclothes cars, we would drive down to Gatwick Airport and we'd sit and wait. We heard a signal over the radio, there's a van coming in, and it looks like the one that's been monkeyed up, i.e. camouflaged, looked like the real thing. Anyway, we let them do what they were going to do. The money had come off a flight from uh, Gibraltar. In the event, when they drove out, we uh, put a hard stop in, which means we basically hijacked them when they came out. They offered no violence. They had no firearms. No shots were fired. Uh, they were arrested brought to London, interviewed, and, you know, it didn't really matter what they said. We had all the evidence in the world, and they were subsequently convicted. We found out subsequently when we opened the bags that uh, there was about a million pounds worth of Swedish krona, Norwegian krona, Danish krona, euros, and, um, and I mean, talking a million in each of those currencies, 
So it was would if they got away with it, it would have been a big, big, uh, a big coup for them. Plus, it would have been a bad news story for the police and Gatwick Airport because security and airport airside had been compromised. Plus, as part of a wider operation, the I call the brains behind it, the criminal family, they were all convicted for conspiracy to rob as well. I want to talk about the 7-7 uh, London bombings. Can you talk to me about working on terrorist attacks of that scale? Right. Um, because of my experience in mass disaster, my boss at the time, who was uh, Cressida Dick, who subsequently became commissioner, came into my office and said, Jim, what are you doing for the next two weeks? And I said, well, nothing, I haven't got any holidays booked. She said, good, because there's been some terrorist incidents in central London. I turned on the TV in my office and they were showing live on Sky and BBC the various scenes where bombs had gone off. One was Edgware Road, uh, one was um, Euston Square, one was the bus in Bedford Square, and the other one, I think, was uh, Allgate East. My first task was to go to uh, the London Resilience Forum, which was based in Millbank, um, and we set out how we were going to set up a mortuary, etc. There was no facilities in London at the time that would have been big enough for the number of casualties we got. We we started, you know, looking at the scenes because it's a murder scene. The uh, anti-terrorist detectives had to go there and uh, get uh, forensic evidence. And I remained at the mortuary. And I'll never forget when the first body started coming, the, the trauma was quite severe to the bodies. You can imagine in a, a very small area in a tunnel, although the blast goes outwards, because of the concrete tunnel it's in and in the train, it implodes in after that. And the casualties were horrendous. But I remember one body that was brought in and the pathologist, one of the pathologists was standing next to me and I said, who do you think that is? And she said, without any shadow of a doubt, that's one of the terrorists. I said, how can you say that? She said, there's no legs. Uh, uh, you know, the rib cage was basically no flesh on it. And clearly the hold on with the bomb was either on his lap or by his feet. And she said that would be my conclusion. We did no invasive post-mortems. We didn't need to because we had metal detectors. We had uh, MIR scans. We had X-ray. Uh, we were able to identify virtually every victim body that came in. I think after two weeks, virtually everyone that had been killed in the incident had been identified. I was going to ask you, what are the techniques of identifying victims when it's such large scale? And the primary identifiers, which is preferable for victim ident identification, is fingerprints. Although if you've got fingerprints, you're virtually alluding to the fact the person has a criminal uh, background. Because why else? Although it's more prevalent now, you've got biometrics and stuff like that. There was more fingerprints about. But then, it wasn't quite the same. And then uh, there's DNA and forensic dentistry. You can identify someone uh, by their lower manual and their teeth. But what took a lot longer and was a bit more of a headache was the property and body parts, because you'd imagine a bomb blast, bits of body go everywhere. Uh, and that was particularly true in the bus in Bedford Square. Uh, there was bits of flesh uh, all over the buildings and all that has to be retrieved, bagged up and identified. And it's identified using DNA. And the first time we ever did that was at the Paddington Rail Crash, and it was groundbreaking stuff. Yeah. And in some cases, I remember one particular victim, uh, I think he was Polish. We had to send the Polish police round to his mother's address to get his toothbrush so we could get DNA from the toothbrush. And then we married it up with his uh, post-mortem 
DNA and it was the same. You can tell me about the Bulgaria case. I wanted to ask about hostage intervention. I think it was in 2005, we received a phone call to Scotland Yard. Uh, a woman had dialed 999 and said her father had been kidnapped. He allegedly gone to Bulgaria, to Sofia, to meet some men to do a property deal. He wanted to buy property. And Bulgaria at that time was emerging from the Iron Curtain uh, and a close association with uh, Russia. And they were applying for EU and all, all that stuff. We told um, the Bulgarians what we feared, that a British national had been kidnapped um, and asked them to do some intelligence gathering around it. In the interim, uh, the kidnappers had contacted this woman and her family and demanded a ransom to release him. Uh, to cut a long story short, it was decided that myself and a detective inspector, uh, Ian Horrocks, who's a friend of mine, we would get on the next plane and go to Sofia uh, to assist the Bulgarian authorities. When we arrived, it was minus 20 degrees, there was about five foot of snow. It snowed massively in the preceding two days. Uh, and it was very difficult just getting from the airport to the hotel. Anyway, in the event, I was asked directly the question, what would you do if this was Eng England? And I said, well, if I knew where they were and they knew the identity of the people that had kidnapped them, I'd do an intervention. Um, and, you know, but you need to gather all the facts and all the intelligence. It turned out it became more, uh, how can I put it, more of an emergency because it turns out the victim was a diabetic and he didn't have any medication with him. Uh, and clearly you can't last forever if you're diabetic and you haven't got any medication. So it became time critical. And the kidnappers were getting more and more jittery because of the phone traffic, making all sorts of threats that they're going to shoot him and all the rest of it. In the event, I was told late that evening by the Bulgarian officer in charge that they knew where the stronghold was, they had it surrounded, and did, it, did I still want them to do an armed intervention? And I said, yes, I do. But you have to do a dynamic risk assessment. You've got to make sure the victim's life isn't at risk or is not going to be put in any more danger than he's in already. Obviously, a right to life is a basic human right, even for kidnappers. And again, members of the public. Fortunately, very rural area, no members of the public were about. And it was getting quite late at night. Dark that time of year. Anyway, a uh, message came across on my mobile phone from the Bulgarians saying uh, two of the men have just got in a vehicle, have left to go to the local village to buy some replies, to buy some supplies. Uh, and I said, well, they said to me, do you want us to do an armed invention? I said, well, if you think it's the right time, I can't tell you to do that. It's your country. But if I had that opportunity, uh, arrest the two, don't let them go back, which they did. No shots fired, nothing like that. But then, um, because of the conditions, the weather conditions, the snow and the full moon, uh, the guys that were doing this, by the way, it's a specialised Bulgarian police unit, like the American SWAT team. They're trained in all this stuff. Uh, and they all had a profile of Romo-Greek wrestlers. There was wide as they were as tall. I mean, they were seriously scary looking people. Uh, but, you know, they train for these scenarios all the time. Very brave men, I have to say. Anyway, they decided to attempt an armed intervention. They crept up to the house. Uh, the kidnapper uh, saw them because of the light conditions. And he had a, a Markov pistol, which is a semi-automatic Russian made pistol, which he fired at one of the police officers who, with his AK-47, came up to the aim, shot him through the head. Uh, very justified, in my humble opinion. We recovered the hostage, 
straight to hospital. He wasn't very well. Uh, I visited him in hospital the next day. We interviewed him, got a witness statement off him, all the rest of it. That that was that, really. Uh, and moving on from that, they were all arrested. We subsequently had to go back and give evidence in Sofia, in the Bulgarian courts. And we actually trained one of the uh, the SWAT team, the Bulgarian SWAT team, in hostage negotiation, which we arranged, uh, arranged and then they had the full skill set. What would you say are like three top most important things in a hostage negotiation situation? Keep talking, negotiation, keep uh, communication open, proof of life, i.e., you know, you need evidence that the person is still alive. Uh, there's a number of ways you can do that. One of them is get them to send a photograph with that day's newspaper, for example. That's a very, you know, basic way of doing it, but there are other ways as well. Um, and basically try and play for time. Try and wear down the kidnappers. You know, agree to everything without actually giving them anything, if that makes sense. It's all about psych psychologically wearing them out and then starting to think, well, are we going to get away with this? Uh, is it worth it? You know, and most things, just to reassure you, most kidnaps in this country, certainly, uh, are all because of drug debts or uh, about gang grab, you know, land grabs, where you've come into my area and we've kidnapped you. Um, where it's very rare you have a kidnap in this country of a member of the public for no apparent reason. Do any of the cases that you mentioned or didn't mention, do any of those cases haunt you? There's one particular case when I was on the murder squad. Uh, there was a six-year-old boy shot in the head and in the, th uh, the thigh, and he subsequently died, and we investigated his murder. And the reason he was killed, it was an act, act of revenge by his mother's ex-boyfriend. Uh, he was a drug dealer. She kicked him out because he was, uh, didn't like the little boy. Uh, he came back to the house, she'd kicked him out. He came back to the house one night and um, he broke in, he raped her. He had a gun, went into the bedroom, shot the little boy in the head and the leg when he was asleep. And then to make matters worse, he made off. Uh, the wo woman came out of her house screaming completely naked Neighbours took her in, called the police. The little boy was whisked off to Great Ormond Street Hospital. I think he lived for 48 hours, but subsequently died of his wounds. Um, as you can imagine, the mother was distort. So we had to debrief her, but obviously in a very sensitive way. That same evening, two uniform officers from Fulham Police Station, we'd circulated this particular individual and his car number, uh, to all officers to look for him. The next morning in King Street, Hammersmith, the car was spotted again and uniform officers again gave chase, all unarmed. They rammed the car uh, and they arrested him after a really violent struggle. He was asped, that's like, you know, police metal bar truncheon type thing. Uh, he was CS gassed and he was still fighting. Um, None of the officers were armed, but they managed to subdue him and they found the gun and it was fully loaded, a revolver. And one of the officers said, I'm sure he, he put the gun out the window and was going to fire at me. And we proved forensically that the gun had jammed. So he probably would have or could have been responsible for the murder of at least three police officers. It's the first time in my service and I've investigated many murders First time I've ever known anybody plead guilty to murder. He pleaded guilty, so we prevented a trial. And why, why do you think that one has this? The age of the, the kid, six. Of the
that six-year-old boys shouldn't be shot and killed. How do you deal with emotional and kind of mental load of this work? Uh, well, it's a job. Um, and some things affect you more than other. I've been quite, a, uh, I'm quite a resilient individual. Um, generally, what works for me, and this work particularly uh, on this particular murder, Perry's murder, and uh, particularly the horrendous uh, state of the bodies on the Paddington Rail Cross and the 7-7 seven, seven, seven bombings, is I go to the pub with my colleagues and we talk about it. We don't bottle it up. We talk about it and, you know, you, you get it all out there. Basically, there has been a lot of criticism of Met Police in, in the recent years. Mm. What is your view on all of that? Uh, I think the roast, recent um, criticism around Sarah Aviard is, is, you know, well, well, it's well documented by every aspect of the media. Uh, Wayne Cousins is a wrong one, pure and simple. He should never have been in the police service. Uh, he wasn't what I call a proper policeman. He was a guard holding a gun outside the American embassy. I just question who is vetting these people. And uh, there are clues in their behaviour. Colleagues have said, oh, he was called the rapist. Well, didn't you go and speak to a senior officer and say, you know, we're not happy about this guy. There's something not right about him. Uh, but you can't wash your hands of it. It, it. We all have ownership for corrupt policemen, for dangerous policemen. We, you know, you've got to do something from within. But I have to say... Part of this is all to do, and it's not just the police, it's the judiciary, the prison service, the national health, is the age of austerity foisted upon us by David Cameron and George Osborne and the worst Home Secretary, in my view, in my lifetime, Theresa May. They've just cut, cut, cut. I remember back in the day, there was police stations all over London we were taught in training school that a police station is a place of safety. Well, there aren't any anymore. If you're a female late at night, you haven't got a taxi to get home, whatever, they used to turn up at police stations. And a lot of the time, a police officer would drive them home or they'd call a taxi to the police station or they could sit there till a member of their family came to collect them. That's all gone. It's a variable career and it's, it's, it's a lot of things do you feel like you've, you've changed the society? I don't think I've changed it. I mean, I've, probably in many ways, I, I was picking up the bits that society doesn't want to deal with. Um, but the job satisfaction you get is that you bring somebody that shouldn't be walking around out there to justice. Hopefully they get locked up for a number of years so they can't do it to anybody else. And more importantly, to give closure to the loved ones of the victims. Angelica Kluke had been battered over the head with a table leg. She had been gagged and her wrists were bound with cable ties. She'd been stabbed 